online presence is growing. I'm constantly being uh, talked to and introduced to people who are finding our ministry uh, that are um, disenfranchised. They don't have a church home. They don't have a place to be. Uh, and uh, they, they find our teachings and uh, then begin communicating with me, whether that's via phone or Facebook or uh, other places. And uh, it opens up great opportunities for ministry. But it also opens up great opportunities for uh, heartbreak. And um, I never know when I pick up my phone because I've got a message what is going to be coming my way. And um, last night I picked up my phone and a um, really nice woman who I haven't had the chance to meet in person yet, had messaged me asking for prayer. And, um, sorry, this one's going to be hard for me. She asked for prayer because her husband had... um, cancer in his, in his head and in his neck that had metastasized to his lungs and, and hospice had um, just told her that he probably wasn't going to make it through the night. And of course, this is a new relationship. This is, you know, this is somebody that I, I, I don't know. And in the messages that proceeded to follow, because we had a conversation um, after that, I am informed that, you know, this this person doesn't have a church family that they can call on, um, didn't have a church home for several years, and so my heart breaks because there's no pastor that can go to the hospital. There's no, um, you know, obviously I can't jump in my car at 10 o'clock at night and drive the hours it would take to get there. Um, And then I'm informed that before she found our teachings, this lady had spent um, the last two years under the teachings of John MacArthur, who we all know is a cessationist and doesn't believe in healing. And um, I went upstairs and I talked to my parents about it because it, it just broke my heart because I couldn't do un, I couldn't undo all the unbelief at the eleventh hour. And God is very good because she got to share with me that God brought her husband about an hour of lucidity there and they got to say all the things that they needed to each other. But there was a moment even in that time That as a pastor, you know, and you, you, you have the privilege of standing before people and, and teaching the word of God, and you know that it's, a, it's an early relationship. You haven't forged that with someone, but you're in this place where you're, you're reaching out to total strangers and you're having an impact on their life, and there's, you're the one that they say, help me, out of nowhere. And all I could do was pray for her peace. All I could do was pray for the Holy Spirit to bring her comfort. I really felt the Lord say, don't don't ask for healing this time because she's made her peace. You can't undo it all right now. And so when we fight in this ministry for the right doctrine, When we fight for a church that operates in power. When we fight for a church that has people that are equipped to stand in the knowledge of who they are in Christ and to undo that unbelief that can 
get in the way of people receiving their miracles, I do so tenaciously because I never know when I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to feel that desperation and that heartache. That makes my heart cry that I could have done more or that I should have been able to do more. And so I come here this morning with a message about why we do what we do. I want to refresh you as you go to 2021 to think about a few things because our model is so different in this ministry. And we are still approaching critical mass. It's closer than it's ever been. So last night, I didn't sleep a wink, not one. I just stayed in the word. And one of the things God kept bringing to my reflections, as many of you know, I participate in these theological discussion groups and debate groups. And there was... There's a gentleman in there that has troubled my heart for a while, and I don't know why I keep going to God about it in prayer. This is incredibly well-read. He's an incredibly strong, critical thinker. And in a lot of things, you would think that we would be doctrinally aligned, and there's just something about it that I keep going to the Lord with. And I just say, something's wrong, God. So this guy sets my hackles off, and I just stay quiet. I won't engage in debate. I won't engage because I, I, I don't know. And this gentleman does a post this past week, and he says, this is my annual reading list. I've been privileged over the last year to read 200 different books in the course of this last year. And, of course, they're all theological, and they're all, you know, deep scholarly texts. And on the surface, that seems so good. But this one time, I decided to engage. And I said, I hope you spent an equal amount of time getting in the Word. And his response to me was not really. And what he proceeded to tell me is most people's definition of, he says, I prefer to study the scripture and you need help to understand the scriptures. You need to look at it critically. And we all do that all the time. That's what we do here, right? But he said, most people's definition of getting in the word is they're waiting for God to hit you with some type of revelation bomb that's personal and, 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 and it's only for you and that's not looking at the word with a critical eye. I said, okay, there's a ditch there. I get that. But it, it rang hollow. And one of the Lord, things the Lord has been challenging me with as I watch these guys post these debates they have between each other on YouTube that nobody ever watches, is at some point God's going to give me the okay to just ask the question, when's the last time anybody in this group led somebody to Jesus? So in response to our little, that was it, brief little exchange there on the group, he posts, a lot of people seem to have a problem with me looking at all these scholarly texts and instead of spending time in the Bible. And I just want to make sure that people know that we need to have help to understand the Bible. The Bible isn't God's love letter to you. We need to read the Bible for what it is. And when he said that, it was the first moment where I started to see, see, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was broken. What we have here is a case of a whole lot of head knowledge and a complete lack of revelation. Now, there's a ditch because there's people who think they read the Bible and God's going to give them a private interpretation of what it says and, and uh, we don't have to use the right theory of interpretation or we don't have to compare what Scripture says to Scripture. There's a ditch on the other side, but you know what? There's, there's a ditch on the side that is completely academic and completely book smart only. There's a ditch on the side of this thing where we don't know Christ. And let me tell you what, 
If anybody can say that just spending time in the Word of God, just marinating in the Word of God, just I, I do not need some high-minded scholar from some theological cemetery to tell me what the Word of God said. God wrote it for me. He wrote it for us. He wants us to understand it. When I pick up my phone and people are hurting and they say, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have a church home. I didn't have anywhere to be till I found you, till I found what you're saying. And they tell me that your teaching is changing my life in the midst of the kind of pain of losing their soulmate. That tells me no matter how small we seem, we're doing something right. Those Belgian reporters were here just in October, just prior to the election, remember? Many of you don't know that, but in the days since, they've tuned in to our broadcast. They've stayed in touch. Michelle's made friends. But when they were here, they said, wow, this is a lot of work and not a whole lot of payoff. You know, I think they were expecting a stadium of people or something. And I said, oh, you don't understand the payoff. I have been so blessed in 2020 to forge the relationships I have with the teenagers that are in this church. You guys are my payoff. We're going into 10 years this March that we've been doing this. And I got to be honest, man, going through 2020, seeing everything Brian knows, everything I wanted to do for business just shot in the head every time I tried to get it off the ground. Everything frustrating. Setback after setback due to things that nobody could control. And then we see the corruption in our government and we see all these. And, and we could stand here and we could get frustrated. We could want to quit. We could want to give up. And last night I couldn't sleep. I basked in the word and when I wasn't in the word, I was listening to Dr. Missler. Let me tell you what, it's, it's a night when you can listen to six solid hours of that guy and not fall asleep. That's a night. At some point, Homer walks across to me and he gets on my chest and he just stares at me because I'm not sleeping and that's weird. You think staring at me will help me go to sleep. It doesn't because the moment I close my eyes, his tongue tries to find its way into my mouth. And if you know where his tongue spent most of its time, you don't want that. But that little dog teaches me something. That's why I bury him in every episode of our TV show. He's taught me something because that little dog, most of, some of you don't know the story. I'm going to tell you the story. We've had miniature schnauzers most of our life. We had one when I was a kid. She got injured very early on, so she did not have the most friendly disposition. If you tried to pick her up, she did this like serpent thing where she bared her teeth and her tongue would flick out at you. She had an injury to her hip. That dog survived my sister growing up, so that was a miracle. Then we had another miniature schnauzer that died in... Uh, 2015, and my mom wanted a puppy, so we got Augie. That didn't work out well because he fell in love with my dad and now goes on the road with him all the time. But in the course of that, in the course of that, my mom in, in her 60s said, wow, puppies are a lot of work. She said, let's get another puppy. This was between Christmas and New Year's 2015. Let's get another puppy to play with this puppy. And we thought, that makes sense. So we went and got this little tiny, full, you know, now he's full grown. He's six pounds, perma puppy sized dog, not manly. And instead of becoming best friends with the other schnauzer, he decides that my Irish terrier is his woman. So guess who gets to spend most of his time with the little brown schnauzer? I usually don't tell that, you know, personal stories when I'm preaching, but I want you to get this. So this little dog follows my 45-pound Irish terrier around with her, and he is just in love with her. He tells me when she has to go outside. 
He tells me when she's hungry. He tells me when she has been outside too long and needs to come back inside. I'm not making any of it up. And all night long when I'm asleep and I carry my aging Irish terrier downstairs and she's on the couch, he stays by her side. And then now because she's aging and she has cataracts, I have to pick her up and I have to take her outside and she wanders around. She has to find her way all the way up the hill to our side lot. And for that brief moment of time, Homer is not with my Irish terrier. He's separated with her for about 15 minutes, even though he spent the entire night with her. And all he wants in the world during that time is to be put outside on his little tether where he stands on the deck and waits with expectation for my 13-year-old Irish terrier to crest the hill and show herself. And though she's blind and can't even tell he's there till they are inches apart, there is joy when they find each other again. He is ecstatic. He is happy. He is overcome. And he's only been outside of her presence for minutes. Here's my goal for 2021. As soon as I get out of the word of God, I want the expectation in my heart to be, I can't wait to be back in your presence. I want to be that little dog standing there, waiting with expectation to get back in the presence of my king because I can't bear to be separated from him another moment. I want to do everything that I do throughout the day to his glory. I want to be constantly mindful of his desires and his needs. And I want to be constantly in a state of expectation of the next time I get to be in his company. I know he never leaves me nor forsakes me. That's not the point. I just want my heart to be in that place. Because let me tell you what. That is one sold out little puppy dog. There's nothing else that's on his mind. It is pure, unadulterated devotion. And I want that. Because when people call me out of desperation, when people call me who don't even know me and want answers or want help, I want to always have the resources and the spirit to provide the care. There's more books to be written. There's a website to launch. There's a TV show to continue to produce. But all that is the work of the ministry. None of that is worth anything. If we're not in constant pursuit of the presence of the master. There are things that I want to understand about the word of God that I don't understand yet. There are, there are things that we need to teach on in this ministry that we have not covered yet here from this platform. But none of that means anything if our heart isn't in the place where our number one pursuit is him. So here's my advice to you for 2021. Here's my admonition to you for 2021. It doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. It doesn't matter whether we're facing COVID-20. Can we make the commitment in our lives this year to pursue his presence like we never have before. Can we be in a place where we are mindful of who he is? Where we step up to the task of obedience and do the things that make us uncomfortable. Where we stay in the word for the word's sake. If somebody can say, I don't just spend time in the word to spend time with the word. I have to, I have to study it critically. I'm telling you, 
if you read 200 books in a year and you have time to put an equivalent amount of effort into the Bible, then you probably do not work a full-time job. Can we be in the place where we recognize that the Word of God is living and powerful. See, that's one of the understandings that we have in this church. Yes, we have to put work. Yes, we have to study. Yes, we have to go beyond the scriptural text to understand the cultural significance or to understand the historical significance, to get the bigger picture. But one thing we can never afford to abandon while we're doing all of that is the fact that the Word of God claims to be different than any other book on the planet because it claims to be living and powerful. And just marinating in it and letting the Holy Spirit hide it in your heart, <coughs> just doing that, leads to powerful Christian living. Smith Wigglesworth was no scholar. He carried his Bible with him everywhere for years. And when he got married, his wife finally taught him how to read it. There are people out there right now that are scared on both sides of the aisle. We have a, a Supreme Court that refuses to potentially hear cases because, as is heard through closed doors, through the walls, that they're afraid that there could be riots in the street if they uphold the law. And as much as that's important for the future of our country, and I would never make light of it, None of it matters if we're not in the Word. Because we don't get our morals, we don't get our values, we don't get our, our identity from being a Republican or a Democrat. We don't get our identity from being a conservative or a liberal. We don't even get our identity from what church we happen to go to. We should be getting our identity from the image of Jesus Christ that is hidden on every page of that text. And then understanding that he gave everything so that we could be like him. And it is based on that that I can say with boldness and confidence And if that's your goal, then for you, in 2021, the best is yet to come. The best lies before us. God will do things in our midst that we can't even begin to understand. We'll step back from it and go, I can't believe this. I can't believe what you've done. It is so fantastic. I'm in awe of you. And all the goals that you have in your life, all the things that you want to see come to pass, if you lay it all at his feet and say, your word comes first. Because through your word, I know you. Guys, we can't forget John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The problem that I have in that sense of someone... That, that can say they don't spend time in the word is they're failing to recognize that that book represents Christ. They're failing to see the integrity of the design like we showed in our Christmas session. We have to remember that if we lose sight of who Christ is, we lose sight of who our identity is in Christ. I'll say this and I'll bring this session to a close. We are going to see ministries fail. We're going to see churches fold. 
Heck, last year we saw a leader in our own community fall. I can't make the decision for you. But I can pledge to you, as I've done for the last 10 years. You're going to get everything that I got to give. We're going to minister the word. And it doesn't matter if there's 100 people in this place or two people in this place. We're going to preach the word. And all I ask in return is that you be in it. And you follow its mandate. Making disciples, Jesus said, is teaching people to observe all the things he commanded his disciples. That's the goal. And so someday, when you pick up the phone, and it's a message from someone that you've touched that you didn't even know you were making a difference in their lives. You're going to have the answer. That's my pledge. Can we dedicate this year to God? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we lift up this dear woman to you, Susan. And I pray that you would bring her peace in this time of sorrow. I pray, Holy Spirit, that your comfort would be so strong. And I thank you for giving them that hour of communication to say everything that needed to be said. Just hearing that from her made me weep at your goodness. Because he knows where he's going. I thank you for your love. Father, prophetically and preemptively, I pray for every person this ministry is supposed to touch in 2021. And by that, I don't just mean my voice. I mean the voices of everybody in this room. Every schoolmate, every co-worker, every family friend, every relative, every stranger. I pray in Jesus' name over the people who know your word that need to speak it forth. And Father, for the things that hold us back, for the things that come into our lives that, that are hard to let go of, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give us enabling strength to press deeper into you. Father, this is your year, and we ask you to put your hand on our year. We ask you to bless this year in Jesus' name. We ask you to bless our efforts to grow closer to our spouses. We ask you to bless our efforts to prosper in our work. We ask you to bless our efforts in Jesus' name to minister your gospel. We ask you to bless us so we can give in Jesus' name, to be obedient to your call to trust you, to do more in our lives when we're obedient to you. Just because you asked. Father, I thank you for each and every soul that's in this room. I pray that you would cause them to shine. And give them the expectancy of true puppy love when it comes to you. In Jesus' name, the people of God said. 